Andy Myler, welcome to Irish Fussy Vlogs. How are you? Are you well? I'm not bad at all, Keith. Thanks very much. All good. good stuff. Now, how are you doing in the pandemic? Because I know it's interesting because the players are struggling, but for a manager, what is it like compared to players? Uh, well, if your players are struggling, you're struggling. <laughs> Typically, if you're, if you're a manager as well. So, um, listen, I think all of us are just getting used to it. It's very, it's very different. Um, it came down so quickly. Nobody had much time to think about it. Um, and I suppose, listen, from, from my from my end of things, I suppose, you know, you've also got a full-time job that keeps you busy, apart from anything else, as well as the football. So, um, listen, we did our best with it. We, we, we tried to keep the guys active for as long as we could. Um, when initially we were trying to work out timelines and when football would be back, we were having group sessions. We sort of, uh, we've sort of taken a step back the last couple of weeks and just kept the guys ticking over. We haven't been having group sessions uh, we've had a few quizzes in the last few whiles just to keep the guys together. Um, but now I suppose as it's becoming a little small bit clearer in terms of the road back and dates are becoming, you know, a slight bit more concrete, we'll start to ramp it up again now as, as we go through. So, listen, the guys have been brilliant from, from their point of view as well. I suppose it didn't, it didn't necessarily fall at a particularly bad time. They had exams coming up. And mm. um, they were busy with that type of stuff. So maybe, maybe from that from that end of things, as as football goes, they had other things things to be concentrating on. So they weren't climbing the walls as much. But um, they they've all come to the end now, and they're really keen to get back playing football. You know, that's good. From your point of view, do you study videos and stuff like that from the games gone by, or is that would that be a bit much now to be looking at videos, DVDs, whatever it is of the games? You've had oh no, no. Week? Listen, I I think everybody does that now. We all do it. Yeah. I mean, straight. <laughs> After every game, you'll come home, and if the, if the if the game has been loaded up in the software in time, you'll you'll generally start pouring over it, good, bad, and bad or indifferent, you know. So, um, and would you keep watching like, or would you watch it once or twice and just park it like, or what way would you do it? I, th I think generally, I think what yeah. you're trying to do is watch it as much as you can right. before the before the next game, um, and before you have to move on. Yeah. Um, I just think there's. Uh, it, it, it's sort of it. I, I think actually, I think a lot of coaches and managers will be like this. Actually, I think you get addicted to it a little bit in terms of oh, yeah. the breakdown and the data available is so good now, um, and the way you can you know clip videos to show them to players and all of those kind of things. Um, it you you can spend a lot of your evenings sort of just tipping away and, and looking at different things and, and thinking about things you, you you must say to a player before we go into the next game. Those type of things. So and what you're going to base your training on during the week. So huge amount of time is spent at, at, at that type of thing and it's it's generally you're on that hamster wheel straight after the game of videos and analysis and that kind of thing and did you find you, you kind of see more do you as well than you would on the pitch because when you're watching a game in a pitch you're kind of engrossed in it at the time as well aren't you but i'd say when you get home and sit down you can really analyze it properly essentially yeah i mean i, I actually think funnily enough i suppose when you're watching a game it, it, it's in person is probably the best way to watch it. You get to see obviously the whole pitch at that time and you don't necessarily can you, get to see Can you kind of stand back, if you like, from the I don't know, emotional side when you're watching the game on the sideline and be able to see things clearly? Is that something do you think you can do that like? Yeah, I I think you can do it. it, it yeah. I'm not saying you do it all of the time or it's very easy to do actually. It's probably yeah. one of the hardest things to, to to learn as a coach or a manager. Um is to actually watch something dispassionately that you're very much involved in. So, um, it's a really hard thing. I mean, I'd I'd be, I'd be hugely impressed. Um, from from guys like looking at guys like you know e even more so rugby guys and guys like Jim Gavin who, who seem to be able to watch a game completely dispassionately and um you know re remove the emotion out of it and just take the data and just take the pieces that they need. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of people in the soccer world that do that. People no. seem to manage in it definitely. Even the best managers in the world are running up and down the sidelines and jumping up and down. And um, so th there's certainly a different culture that we have. So, um, but I, I think you know, I think the best managers you work for over the years as well, and and guys that can dissect the game generally have that skill. Can look at a game without getting drawn into it too much, and are able to say things at half before the game, at half time, and after the game as well in terms of just take the pertinent pieces out. Um, and that, that's a, I suppose that's a skill that all managers and coaches are working to and you're not born with it I don't think it's just you know something you have to get there 
Yeah, it's interesting because I've often seen some managers saying that they can see things better from the stands, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, you probably know that yourself, but um, that's probably a point because when you're at pitch side, you're, it's a different angle, isn't it? It's a different perspective. The stands, you can probably see more across the pitch and the far side and, and that yeah. kind of thing. But as you say, managers don't really do it, do they, in soccer? Like, you do see it in rugby pretty much. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. The director's box and they're communicating the whole time. Yeah. They look, they're not banging at the windows. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and it's, it's something you look to do. I mean, and actually, like, yeah. we've looked to do it at UCD piece and, and we, we you would try, you would see it. I used to do it at Rovers sometimes when I was there yeah. um, coaching as well in that actually, if you have a person from the coaching staff in the stand, yeah. actually, the insight can be really quite good, uh, especially at half time in the game, actually, in terms of uh, when people are looking at it because they do get it. You do get a very different view of the game. It is a better view of the game, to be quite yeah. honest. Um, and I think, listen, sometimes I think sports just need a time to make the jump. I, I don't think it'll be too long till you see managers of teams actually sitting up and having, you know, whatever the best view of the game is. Um, for some reason in soccer, we feel like it's, you know, constant instruction needed, needs to be given to the players on the pitch and stuff like that. And it's not something I, 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 there's something I try and don't not do, actually, is to be too much in the players' ears because once the game starts, the game starts, and, mm. and you know they've got they've got to be able to play uh, themselves as well. But uh, I think I think soccer will move that way. It's just that we haven't yet. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because um, maybe some managers are fearful of being up in a crowd as such, or is it just the, the style of I don't know? I think it's just a, I think honestly I, I think it's just a cultural yeah. thing. I don't think yeah. it's I don't get people being being afraid of being in crowds or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 really just I mean it's like any walk of life or job around them something has been done a certain way for for so long actually sometimes it can be quite hard to to change that and um, I mean like you know Gaelic managers are the same you, you see one or two of them sometimes sitting the first half out and some soccer managers have done it in the past as well sit the first half up in the stand the director's box or whatever and then you know come down for the second half so it's been tried and there's different pieces of it. Rugby have really, really embraced it. But it's a different, I mean, the other part of rugby is that I would say it's a different sport. It's a very set-piece sport. So it yeah. lends itself to sort of, you know, fixed pieces of play. Oh, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so m maybe that's why they do it. And, you know, maybe maybe we're never ultimately able to get all the way to where they are in terms of how they look at the game. Mm -hmm. um, but it's creeping in. You see it more and more in Gaelic and stuff like that, which would be a more similar game to our own in, in terms of just, you know, off the cuff action, I suppose, from, from that end of thing. Faster pace. Did you yeah. find when you were a player, would you be able to take instructions from a manager on the pitch or would it kind of go over your head a little bit when you're on the pitch? Uh, no, I, I think yeah. <laughs> I would say this, but I think it was, I think it was OK for taking instruction <laughs> as a player, but not i suppose not, not that when a game is breaking out as well sometimes and listen this happens as a manager as well you'll, you'll speak to players after the game where you said it was you know was asking you to do x and they say yeah but you know that wasn't really me lived experience on the pitch i was trying to actually this was happening or that was happening you may not have you may not have picked up on all the clues so mm -hmm. I, I think some stuff goes in some some stuff you have to disregard as, as, a, mm -hmm. as a player if you're thinking about it as a player is that there's only so much instruction you can take on. There's a, there's a game going on as well that needs to be played. So, um, yeah, I, I think, listen, you, as, it's, no, it's no different than more uh, any walk of life. You listen to some fellas, not listen to other fellas so much. That's actually, <laughs> true. <laughs> That's actually true. Now, you started your playing career with UCD, funnily enough, as well. It's a while ago now, I think, 94 to 97. Mm. What do you remember from that experience? Who was the manager at the time? What kind of players were playing in that team, do you remember? Uh, the manager at the time was Tony O'Neill, so um, he was the guy who signed us. So uh, mm. I would have, I suppose, signed when we were just seventeen or so, or finished under seventeen's football. And um, so the guys that would have been in the team, so so I would have joined with guys like Tony McDonald and stuff like that. And the guys there would have been like Terry Palmer, Jason Caldwell, Mick O'Byrne, um, mm. and then later on guys like James Keddy would have joined. Um, and there was, listen, there was. There was a really good group of players at the club at that stage. Obviously, they got promoted. Uh, we got into the Premier, all, all of that kind of stuff. Had won the um, first division, so it was um, it was a really good group of players who went on to have really good careers. Um, obviously, uh, Mac or Tony Max 
stayed at UCD for the rest of his career, but um, the other guys, Jay, Terry obviously went to Rovers, James uh, went to Derry, I think. From clubs, yeah. yeah, but would have won a lot of stuff in his mm. in his career as well. So um, I'm missing I'm missing out guys there, Robbie Griffin, um, all of those Rob guys Griffin, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Jay Kelly. I mean, th- these they were all very good players. Um, mm. and uh, it was listen, it, w- it was a great time. UCD is an amazing club at uh, the start of your career. I, do- I would always say, even to young players. Uh, yeah, even if you don't go to college there, such you can still play there, can't you? Just to get well, that out at, there. Well, at, at that stage you could. At that yeah. stage there was, there was a, a little bit more blurry lines. Not so much okay. now. You absolutely have to be in college now. But oh, you do. Have even, now, even with that, I, I would say the guys, it's, it's an amazing place to, to play your football when you're a kid because, like, typically you're closer to the first team than you would be at any other club, and mm. um, because lots of the players are young, you, you, you typically will get a chance. And um, so you typically will get a chance to play. Um, it sort of eases you into it a piece um, because everybody's around the same age and stuff like that. You know, for some guys, and it's not not for everybody, but certainly for some guys, you see that might go under in another dressing room. Um, in terms of you know the the dressing room politics, they're harsh enough places at the time uh, uh, or at the best of times that it really suits some young guys and the guys who will get on in other dressing rooms will get on anyway at UCD. So. It actually, it's, it's a, bit, a little bit more holistic uh, uh, from that point of view. So, I mean, the, the guys I'm still friendly with are the guys I went, I, I played football with at UCD. Um, typically, they're the, they're the friendships that have, you know, uh, lasted over the years. Um, so, it's a it's an incredible place to start uh, your football career. We have guys in our first team now at the moment, even though it was the same back then. You could leave, you know, UCD at 21, haven't played well over 100 games. Yeah. You know, so there's not many... 21 year olds at other clubs who do that you know so um it's a it's a fantastic ground and from that end of things yeah i always find the players if they're at ucd if they can stay at ucd for a number of years and mm-hmm. then they can move on like you know what i mean the 10 those players tend to progress a bit better don't they yeah i think listen i, I think it's it's proven in the league when you look around the league at the moment i think the cup final was a very good um example of it last year the amount of ucd players on the pitch eight or nine or so or whatever um and I think exactly that. Th- those guys have actually played a lot of football at a, at a very young age, and it's such a good base to move on from um, in terms of the rest of their career. Um, they get, like, I mean, there's, there's so many papers and everything else written about that, the, the importance of playing football at that, at that early age when you leave school, but you need to keep playing in, in games. And usually <coughs> avoids that opportunity. So they have that, they have that base, and it's important for the rest of their career for sure. It's funny, I spoke to Rob Manley and he was at UCD and he said when he moved to Bowles, though, he felt like he didn't quite fit in. Like, I, I just got the sense from his point of view, he probably went to Bohemians too early. But when you get an offer from Bohemians, it's hard to turn down. That's the other side of it, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, he said he struggled there for a year or two. Obviously, now he's with Longford Town, having done well yeah. with Cameron Peely. Yeah. But um, maybe he's an example there. Maybe you know, going to a big club, maybe a little too early in his career. The likes of Robbie Benson, who's at UCD for a long, long time and still has had a brilliant career outside of UCD, do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's never too late in your yeah. career, let's say, you know. Also at UCD, I always find, if there's some way they can keep the same team together for two or three seasons, they could, yeah, they could have yeah, one yeah. hell of a team, like, you know, and that's nearly any UCD team, you could say, like, you know. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, a lot of that is, is is sort of timing. I mean, actually, yeah, the, is, yeah. like uh, some guys get it right, some guys get it wrong, and you know, I, I think getting it wrong sometimes in terms of the time that you leave or the time you move on can actually make maybe sometimes cost you actually an extra year or two actually getting getting back to where you were you were almost uh, when you left UCD. So, um, I, I think you understand when certain clubs come in and want players and people want to jump, this fine, but. I think even in, in the last one, I think, it, you know, Gary O'Neill at Rovers is probably a good example of it, of, of a guy who, who had uh, been at UCD for a few years and went straight into to, to Rovers and, 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 and actually, you know, looked right up at that level in terms he of... He learned prob- trade pretty much. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm probably beyond it. And Liam and Neil, uh, to an extent, are the same as well, who had done those three, four years at the club um, and looked really really ready just to go on to the next level yeah. um, and i'm listen from time to time it doesn't work out guys will make that jump it, it, it won't go that way but that's you know that, that happens at all uh, pieces of football but from the close point of view i suppose in terms of the cycle I, I i think actually what happens typically is when you're building a team 
um, and when when it's college based, it will typically take two or three years to get to you know to a point whereby you know guys have guys just have enough experience and are grown up enough to actually challenge uh, properly for you know first division titles or whatever else of that. And then it's typically coming to the end of that cycle at that stage, and then it will be broken up. I think that's what happened last year with the guys. It's just it, it's more an unlucky time. And if you if almost if you got promoted a year earlier, if you could get promoted a year earlier, you'd almost get that full year in the Premier League as well, where guys will be developing again. So it's a real nuance of time in, in the model that we have at the club. Yeah, and yeah. um, those are the three or four year cycles. I think the transfers in mid season last season kind of yeah. Thought. Yeah, cost a little bit. That that would have been the thing. I think it was who was it? Neil Frugge and Gary O'Neill, wasn't it? Who left? Neil Neil Frugge and Gary O'Neill, and then yeah, I suppose who left from the Liam was yeah. Liam was almost gone and stuff like that. Um, and Dara O'Connor obviously left at the start of the year and stuff like That's that. It. So I mean, it's yeah. I listen. mean, if any club, if you think of any club, just say for example, are losing those players of that quality. Yeah, absolutely. A huge loss. Never mind. You know what I mean? Any yeah. any club in the league. So yeah. That, short space of time it's very difficult that side of it, isn't it though yeah listen i i think you see how much actually some of those players improved the teams that they went to i think that's the the key part uh there so i mean you, you you've taken them out of a team that was looking to stay in the division so there's always um you know it's going to be difficult to replace that but yeah. you know the 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 club are um i suppose they're realistic about those type of things as well you know yeah. Um, and uh, that it was what it, it was what it was, I suppose, last year. But that's through no fault of anybody's at the club as such. It's just you know it's the nature of if you lose half your team, that's the that's what's going to happen. Yeah, the Shamrock Rovers, particularly the work the Shamrock Rovers have done, if they come knocking for one of your players, it's very difficult for a player to refuse that, isn't it? Yeah, listen, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's a Rovers are a massive draw to, to the guys who play football in this country. So. Um, I, like I say, I think the club understands that when when teams like in the past Dundalk and Rovers and other teams have come for players, you know, understand why players are are interested in it. You try to give them the best advice that you can. Some players have got that jump absolutely right. Some players have not got it right. You know, so yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you played for Newry Town as well, actually in Northern Ireland. Um, mm. How did you find the league? I know you were young as well, but did you find much differences playing in the Irish League to League of Ireland at that point? Yeah, they're, they're different places. I think they're still different places in terms of that. Um, I mean, even at that stage, I suppose, the League of Ireland was starting to change, um, you know, training, etc., become a more professional environment. I think the North took a long time to get away from sort of Tuesdays, Thursdays type of stuff, uh, training was The football was, was, a, was a little bit different. Um, I've always felt that the standard... In the south is probably better overall like overall i think over the last few years it's you know it's really pushed on in terms of quite a big divide and the reason why the satanta cup probably died and stuff like that was that divide it just got yeah. a bit too big um but um I, I listen i enjoyed my time up there i played a lot of good players and um, and there was there was a decent like it was it was a decent standard and probably more comparable then to what it is now there was lots of good players even coming from i mean the the players that used to go up in the train every week and um, from the south to the north to play on a Saturday, there was a lot, there was a lot of good players in that uh, train that could easily have played in the League of Ireland as well and did play in the League of Ireland um, for a lot of their careers. So, um, a number of our players played up in Uri. Did Johnny McDonald play in Uri? Yeah, I was there when I was there. I was yeah. there with Johnny McDonald. Yeah. Typically, it was the two of us. Um, but like, I mean, you would have had you know Gary Haylock and Vinnie yeah. Arkins and uh, guys like. Um, uh, Gary Sloaney and PJ O'Connell and all these type of guys that were one of the good players, you know. So, um, they um, it was like it was competitive. The teams up, up the north would have been uh, fairly competitive at that stage with uh, League of Ireland. I think it was just. Uh, you find football more physical, actually. Northern football. Yeah. No, I think really, League no. of Ireland's more physical. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah at yeah. that time, like. At at that time, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd definitely definitely got more kicks this side of the border than the far side of the border. Was that why you moved to Monaghan after that? Was it? I, did, I just, I just needed to get back over the border again. Um, so yeah, so so that I was. Did you find playing in Monaghan? You scored a lot of goals in Monaghan. I think it was twenty-two league goals or something like that in forty-eight games. Uh, unfortunately, Monaghan are gone now, which is one of the sad realities of Irish football. But uh, how did you find playing for them at the time? Listen, I. I 
I can honestly say, like, no matter which club you asked me about here, I enjoyed my I enjoyed my time playing because um. But Monaghan was a like a fantastic experience. I'd left UCD. I'd gone up to Newry. I'd done okay in Newry for the first year. Uh, second year wasn't doing wasn't doing brilliant, and it got to the middle of the year, and it was just I needed to do something else, and the, the the window was coming up, and um Billy Baxter gave me a ring, um and I remember we I went up and. They had an amazing squad of players at that time, uh, uh, Monaghan, from guys who were who had had really great careers. Like there was guys like Joe Hanrahan, John Cody, Bobby Brown, um, all of these guys were up there playing, um, and like they had an incredible amount of experience in the team. And like as you go through, you think you think back in your career of where you learned and where you didn't. I learned so much playing for Monaghan that uh, that team just just in all types of uh, areas. And um, there was they were really solid guys paul hall all these guys they were really really solid uh human beings apart from anything else you know so um and good guys and as a sort of i think probably 21 or so at the time um just learned an awful lot from, an awful lot from them did quite well as said scored a few goals all that kind of stuff uh the two seasons it was there went went quite well um but uh i think bobby had then taken over and stuff like that uh, and i did an offer from at loan i think at the time and listen, Monaghan, you know, uh, weren't a big club, didn't have a lot of money, all of those kind of things. And if you were doing, if I suppose if you were doing well at Monaghan at the time, you generally moved on or whatever else like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's how that happened. But yeah, listen, Gary Haylock, Bobby Brown, all of those guys, really, really good guys and guys you could, guys you could learn from, real football people. And speaking of Athlone, you're obviously you were top scorer at Athlone, I think, two seasons in a row, isn't that right? Um, I, I might have been. I, I left halfway through Definitely the second season. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I got I got an indecent proposal halfway through the second season, so I had to I had to move on. So um, uh, yeah. Listen, the, the, the first season that long obviously went brilliant. Fifty five games. So just to throw that out there. It's Say again. Thirty eight goals in fifty five games. So just to put it out there, that's a pretty good record. Yeah. So it, it went it went okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It it was good. The first season particularly went really well. Um. And uh, we listen. We sh- we should have got promoted. We didn't in the end. The wheels came off a piece, and actually Monaghan came up and, and pipped us um, uh, at the end. So uh, great decision by me to uh, <laughs> to move on. But um, they were you, that's why. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, listen, we were miles ahead at some stage. I think we were eleven points up in the docks, and but the dock yeah, by the by the end had had had, yeah. had won the had won the league well. Yeah. Um, but um, Real, it was a real regret. I remember, just it was a real regret at the time. Still is probably a regret in terms of not going up with that. I actually think I don't actually think Athlone almost recovered from that. Um, you know, until I know they were up in the Premier later on yeah. in, in the day and stuff like that. But I, I think the club was at a good point then. Big crowds, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, going to the games, it was uh, was good, and we we just we just missed that one. So it took a while for them to get back, but. Um, the, there's uh, huge potential yeah. in that loan, though, isn't there? Like, yeah, it's it's for, like for, when I was the there, where it is and the colleges and things like that, like you know, there's potential yeah, when I was, there. Yeah, when I was there, there was like I mean, like I say, we we're getting decent enough crowds at games. There was a couple of times it was it was fairly packed the ground, um, uh, and we were on we were on the up for a lot of that season. Um, so like I I always thought that you know it's if somebody can. If it can get just a you know an injection of money, you can do something. It's really there to take off. I think, like you say, it's it's a football town that long, you know. So um, um, it's it it hasn't got there yet, but it certainly still has the potential. You'd hope, you know. Speaking of a football town, I know you had a brief spell at Waterford, but you went on to draw the United, and actually, you're talking about loan there. Draw are kind of similar, but maybe draw have kind of in general they've harnessed that potential a bit better than that loan have, you know. Mm. But um, how did you find it at United Park? You scored a lot of goals there as well. You were there for a few seasons as well. How did you find that? Yeah, listen, I, I love playing for I, I love playing for Drada. As I think we would have said a lot in the past. I had a few great seasons there. Um, I had you know two great managers, Harry McHugh and Paul Doolan. Uh, while I was there as well, uh, different but very good in, in different ways. Um, and again, actually, even in terms of guys you meet going through football, we actually had a, just had a, when I got to draw the initial, we had a really good group of lads uh, that we that still keep in contact with. So, um, they were just really good. But I, listen, draw had to just whatever it is. Sometimes in your in when you're playing football, it just clicks. Draw had just suited me. Um, I like I like playing there. I remember I used to actually like playing in draw and playing in United Park before I ever played for draw. 
Um, I was one of those places that I just seemed to it just seemed to get on well. Uh, it clicked at a good a good sort of partnership with Fabio there in um, in Drod as well over the years as well. The two of us sort of got each other when we were playing. So which um, you don't see these days very often, two strikers up top. No, nobody ever nobody ever play. I'd be I'd be I would be fact playing now because uh, nobody plays two up top. And uh, so I don't know where I'd play actually these days, but um, the uh, yeah, I think listen, it's it, it's one of those things that when I look back from all the that that period, I was probably playing my best football. Um, yeah, I draw it as well in terms it, of your long. longest spell in your career, wasn't it? it yeah, 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 it was. Um, listen, that's what I, up, I suppose yeah. it's the nature of League of Berlin football sometimes as well in terms of you know you you, you find yourself moving. Despite the fact you may not even want to move uh, at, at certain points, but that's certainly the nature of the beast. But um, yeah, yeah it, listen, it was it, it was uh, the longest spell, probably probably at UCD a little bit longer than it was at Drada. But um, the uh, it was a great, it's a great club. It's a mm-hmm. it's a great club, a real football town. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have a great support as well, and when they're doing well, you know they'll really get them out. So yeah, it's great. To, it, it, it was great to see them going on and winning things. At, um, uh, and being successful, and you'd hope to see them back there at some stage as well. Yeah, you moved on into Longford Town, and who was the manager there? Alan Matches. Alan Matches, yeah, top yeah. manager as well. Yeah. Um, how did that go for you? And did you play with Barry Ferguson? Yeah, Barry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry, he was centre back, wasn't he? Centre back, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, how was that experience? Longford a good team, didn't they? Yeah, Long- Longford had a, Longford had an excellent team. Longford yeah. had just won the cup twice, uh, two yeah. two in a row when when I got there and stopped them winning cups. But uh, the uh, <laughs> not um, bad timing though. Now listen, they like as a squad goes, they had a serious squad of players at Longford when I was there as well. Like the likes of um, I'm gonna forget half these guys as well. But Barry Ferguson, for instance, uh, yeah. Sean Dillon, um, Desi Baker was there. Uh, Paul Keegan, Stephen O'Brien, and goals, great goalkeeper. Um, you know, uh, right across the pitch, Sean Prunty, Alan Kirby, all these guys, um, Alan Murphy, Roy Full had really good careers in the game, had won cups, had won things, and stuff like that. Um, so it was a really good squad, um, of players. Um, it probably, you know, they, they we, we, the team or the, the club had had that success and stuff like that. Um, I think we finished fourth or fifth the first season in the league. I think, mm. um, uh, if if I'm correct, uh, I think that the big downer for us when it was at Longford would be the horrific result in Europe um, against a well side, where we'd won the we'd won the um, the first leg two 0 and I honestly thought we I honestly think we just thought it was done, uh, was gone, yeah. and uh, we were one all at half time even away, so we did an away goal and everything else like that, and we still managed to lose. Five one or something like that in the second in the second leg. It's it's one of those haunting moments. I don't think I've ever got over it actually. My 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 mom said to me there a few weeks ago that she had some half and half scarf that she had got at the game that says Carmarden versus uh, Longford. You didn't want to see it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I still can't look at that. What was the dressing room? You probably remember the dressing room just must have been sick after that game, were they? Funereal is that a word? Yeah. Um. It's uh. Yeah. It was. It was just sick. I mean, actually, like, I mean, I, and I mean that from the point of view of even, I'd say, I'd say most of the guys in the dressing room probably felt the same, like physically, almost physically ill. Um, and even as I'm talking about it here, I can, I can, you can, you can still, you can still get back there. Uh, it's people who talk about football saying you remember the lows more than you remember the highs and stuff like that. That one, you, you I was actually get... going to ask you later on what was your worst moment in football. I don't th- I think that's it. Isn't it? Oh, listen, it's <laughs> you know, you know what? If you had to ask me that, I probably wouldn't have brought it up myself. You know? <laughs> it was, uh... oh, <laughs> but it was, um, it was, yeah, it was horrific. It's just, without going into too much detail, but when, when things are going wrong like that in a pitch. Is everyone just looking at each other like it's, it's how do you, you just can't stem a tide sometimes, can you? Yeah, I mean that was it. I mean when you when they think back to that game, there yeah. were certain decisions and everything else like like that that it seemed that one point in the second half that anything that could happen was going to happen. You know, anything that could go wrong was going to go wrong. There was they got a penalty and all, all sorts of stuff, but like exactly sometimes things get beyond you. You can't get you can't grapple them back in. That was it was just one of those nights, uh, one of one of those things. It was um yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> Shamrock Rovers then you moved to you scored fifteen goals in forty-five games. I think you won the first division title, is that right as well? 
I think they scored more than four, 15 goals as well. 15 league goals, was it? Maybe Six, more 16, goals. 16 league goals, I think. Oh, was it? So you probably scored more overall competitions, didn't you? <laughs> not that I want to, not that I want to pull you up in the <laughs> county or like that, but... You say loads of goals, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how's that experience playing for Shamrock Rovers, such a big club? And I know they're in the first division, so they probably feel they shouldn't be in the first division, let's be honest, you know? Yeah. But the experience playing for such a big club like Shamrock Rovers must have been... Where did you play at the time? What ground were you playing at at the time, actually? We were, we were playing in Talca at the time. Yeah. Um, listen, I was a... As some people would know, I was a lifelong Rovers fan. Family, my dad's a massive Rovers fan. <laughs> Um, would have been brought Milltown as a kid, all that, all that kind of stuff. So it was was into it. So had spent most of me hope, had spent most of my career hoping at some stage that I get a chance to play for over. So um, that was my chance. So um, I just thought it was a, it was brilliant. Couldn't wait for it. Um, and in my very first training session, went over my ankle and was out for six weeks. I remember I had only signed the previous night. Was getting ready to play for the Friday. Train up in Crumlin and uh, went over in six weeks. So I had to wait, wait a long time. And, uh, but obviously, we were in the first division at the time, as you say. Um, really young team. I was probably, you know, one of the, I was 30 at the stage of playing for overs, I think. So, um, um, really young team. Uh, guys who would come from Leicester Senior, all kinds of paddle pulled a, a squad of really good young players together, guys who come back from England, etc. Really fit, all of those, uh, all of those well organized, um, and have, were top of the first division when we got there. So, we, we, I mean, we managed to hold it together. We added a few players as well, uh, and we got it over the line. And, like, I, I'd, I'd often say is actually the only reason why Shamrock Rovers are in the first division is because they're Shamrock Rovers. Because even that team that went down from the Premier Division, there have probably been, uh, you know. Everybody, every to- every every week, somebody goes out to play against Rovers. It's a big thing. It didn't matter actually if you were in the first division or whatever else. At that, um, it was massive to to clubs to play against um, uh, Rovers. Oh, and I don't think I think that still happens even most weeks in the Premier. Still, Rovers are Rovers are the name, and people want to play against them. You know, so um, it's an amazing experience. It's a real proper football club, Rovers. Uh, you get the sense that when you're there, you're you're playing for something that's you know quite unique and quite big and stuff like that. So, um, it was uh, it was great. So for a Rovers fan, like like anybody who's you know anybody who grows up supporting a team, whether it's yeah. you know Pats and Dark Bowls, whatever, and um, if you get a chance to play for them, it's a fantastic thing. You can look up into the stand, you see your folks up there and stuff like that. You know, um, everybody's proud as punch. Yeah, and a few years later, obviously, you became part of, um, I know you've done some work with the under-20s and that at Rovers as well, and you've won a title as well, but you became part of Michael O'Neill's backroom team at Shamrock Rovers. First of all, what was it like working with Michael O'Neill? And obviously, it was a great couple of years, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was like, amazing. With the success, like. It was an amazing couple of years. Uh, I'd spent, obviously, I went in, when I finished playing, I'd, I'd gone in as the reserve team coach, and then yeah. eventually, we'd sort of taken the reserves and the under-20s, so... We'd had a bit of success over the two years with, with those groups, and um, then um, I think Trevor left, and I'd gone up to the first team with Michael and Jim Jilton who'd come in as well, and that was just before the European uh, run as well. So uh, we were obviously went on to win the the Premier League that season, but the European uh, run is probably what it's remembered for. And um, so the nights like, you know, the night in Belgrade, etc., all of that kind of stuff is just an amazing experience. Um, we're working with Michael. Like, my, my, listen, Michael is a good, like a good, good manager um, an excellent manager, as you know, has been proven since he left Rovers, obviously, as well. The job he did with Northern Ireland. Uh, no doubt that, you know, you'll, you will see Stoke back arriving on the horizon again as well um, over the next world. Um, I mean, just uh, exceptionally good with players. Different types of players mm. uh, and how to get the best out of them. You know, you've, you've worked with worked with lots of managers over the year who can get the best out of a certain group of players from the team, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, others don't, or he struggles with certain types of players. So he knows how to deal with a different type of character. Right? Yeah, that I mean, yeah. The, I think that's a superpower, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Just is, actually. Yeah. Uh, Working with the working with the individuals as well as the group are just and, and somehow you know getting all of those individuals motivated to a point where it works for the group you know so um, I think that's what you would be um, and that's what you'd be learning very strong on the football side of things as well now don't get me wrong but um, uh, newest stuff there um, 
uh, and was very clear about what he wanted the team to do. I think, which is another thing, had a, had a really good clarity of sort of communication and stuff like that with uh, with the group as well. So yeah, lots 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 you could learn there, and obviously just uh, a very very successful couple of years for the club as well. You know, so it was a great. This is a great place to be around at the time. Tala was new. The fact that, yeah, it's you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. You know, Real Madrid are in town, Juventus, you know, you name it. It's, you could, you probably couldn't have wrote a script for three years like that, you know? Yeah. Obviously, there was a bit of a downturn with Rovers when he left, which isn't a surprise because, as you say, he's such a good mm. manager. But would you say, obviously, you were at UCD a few years later, let's say, <laughs> yeah. and you were working behind the scenes at UCD. What was your role behind the scenes before you've taken the manager's job, the senior manager's job? So I, I just, I mean, I had, uh, when I finished with Rovers, I'd sort of mm. done a year with Pat's 19s while well, I was finishing off the A license That's and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, the, uh, so I'd, I'd actually taken a break after I'd started, mm. I'd started my own day, day job out in UCD mm. for a couple of years. Uh, but I, I knew the guys from the club, even from, you know, um, obviously playing there years ago, but actually more so uh, the likes of Dermot and stuff like that from having coached teams against each other and stuff like that over the years. Um and I'd meet them when I was going for a run at lunchtime or doing something, and we'd just be chatting football or whatever. And uh, they'd said to me on one or two occasions, "Leave, you wanted to get involved back with you know the college team or whatever else like that." So um, I had given it a break for a really few years. I'd you know I'd had a look at what weekends were like uh, for everybody else, for normal people, and um, I'd gone on holidays when you know you, football people can't go on holidays, all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, and I'd, I was really settling in, I'll be honest, to, the, to, to that as well. It was, it was a, a lot of that stuff was nice. Um, but yeah. I suppose at that stage, the, you know, that period of time, the kids were quite small, all of that kind of stuff. So there's yeah. reasons for you to be around. The kids are a bit older now and stuff like that. So I had said to Dermot, listen, uh, wouldn't mind getting involved. The college team, when we were having a conversation one day. So we went out and the college team, obviously, as it's set up at the moment, is the first mm-hmm. team, pretty much the first team in UCD, the same game squad of players. So, um, the quality was so good and stuff like that. It just gave me a real bug for it again. Um, and then I suppose that uh, I got a bit of a, a goo. You I mean, know what? I wasn't doing anything about it too much. I was going to go back to the college team again this year. And um, it was only when, obviously, uh, things changed last year with the managerial stuff at UCD. Um, and there was a change at the end of the season. I was, I was, I was approached then mm-hmm. uh, just before the start of this year um, to see w- would I have any interest in it. So... Um, it made me think about it. Um, I hadn't given it a great deal of thought, but if there was one club actually that would probably coast back into it was going to be UCD. Um, it was set up very nicely for me. As I say, I work in UCD as well, so all of those things were aligned. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the kids were that bit older, all of that, all of those kind of things. And I, I, I think it was at a point whereby if I didn't say, if I wasn't going to get back in now, I wasn't going to get back in, you know, the type of way. So um, I think it just lined up uh, really nicely. And it's a... Uh, it's just a fantastic club, like I said, as much as a player, it's a great club to be involved in as a coach as well. Yeah, and there's a few players there now, um, I think Josh Collins and Yo-Yo as well. A lot of people, they rate them very highly. How would you see them? Are they good lads or good players? Or do you think they'll have to go on and have yeah. good careers? We, 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 yeah, we, we don't we want rate, to lose them. No, we rate them very highly as well. So not just, What's that? not just other people, we rate them very highly yeah, as well. Yeah, I can imagine so. so yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, listen, uh, again, there, there'll be a, we we have another crop of players there at the moment that yeah. I doubt we'll will we'll see playing in the League of Ireland right through and, and maybe beyond actually as well for for one or two of them hopefully. Um, there's a really good crop. There'll be another good crop who'll come in on scholarship this year as well that will add to that as well, um, which I think we needed because we we had such a clear out last year actually we we you know we needed to restack a little bit as well so hopefully. This will make us a little bit stronger going forward. But guys like exactly guys like Josh, guys like Yo Yo, um, guys like yeah. Paul Doyle, those guys, Evan Ozam, those guys have been there for a few years and stuff like that. And like I say, have fantastic, still very young men, but with great experience. Um, and I've no doubt that they'll that they'll when their time comes at UCD, there'll be other clubs that are interested. I suppose it's our job at the moment to do the to do the best we possibly can for those guys, um, and. You know, give them whatever experience, give them whatever knowledge that we can pass on. Uh, that's what we're looking to do. Um, but another, listen, UCD has always done a, another good crop uh, will come along, um, and those guys will will do well in football for sure. Yeah, there must be a lot of clubs that they'd be hanging around the place like vultures. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Most, most of the crowd at a UCD game is other fellas looking at your players. So that's exactly. But for the season ahead, though, we'll just say the season's going ahead, right? Um, what would be what would the ambitions be for you? Would it be promotion? Do you think? Do you think your the squad is good enough? Dude. I suppose I, I think this this yeah. this year for us I think was a little bit like setting the reset button a little bit. Um, we're starting a new group as such. Um, there's um, you know, mo- I suppose a larger part of the squad is new than would have been in previous years, and and there'll be guys coming there'll be guys coming to a natural stop and a natural end with us in terms of scholarships and stuff like yeah, that as yeah. well. Just just even in the squad as apart from in the first eleven as well at times. So. That that needs to be reset a little bit. Um, for me, I, I suppose what we wanted to be was very competitive in the first division. We didn't set, we don't set a goal like winning or anything like that. The goal we always set with the lads is is just performance. So, uh, we're just looking for performance on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. We'll take what whatever comes after that. So we just want those to got those guys to perform personally and then perform as a team. So. That's the mantra that we're trying to set. We're not saying if that performance takes us to the playoffs, fine. If it makes us win, fine. If we can't get there, but we're happy with a performance, fine. Yeah, exactly. And it's being happy with the performance and being being comfortable. I think we're comfortable with. I think what we have in the in the dressing room at the moment, um, you know, we've got some guys, you know, our captain Jack uh, Keeney, Liam Kerrigan, like I said, Doyle, or Yo-Yo, Josh, lots of good players, lots yeah. of good players, um. And I think if we can if we can start to maintain the hardest thing I think and this is thing the UCD teams in general struggle with the hardest thing with young players is the consistency of the the performance. Yeah, you know it's the controlled performance that would win any Premier Division game one week and then you know str- struggle the next week. And I think it's just ultimately they're all learning and they're all learning together, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you lack at times, I suppose, an older head. Let's say. Literally yeah. an older head, like you know, and 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 there's a patience involved in that, and yeah. I suppose from the older head point of view, you're hoping that's what the likes of myself and Ian Ryan add to the to the situation, if you know what I mean, because uh, you're not you're not going to have it in your team, no. So you need to you need to have it somewhere around the place. So, um, I I think that's the that's typically the challenge that we have. So a little, it's not uncomfortable. I suppose if the league gets up and going again, um, I think mm. we'll be all right. Um, I'll finish off with a few questions. Um, who you, who's the best player you've played with in your career? You have to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> Just insult most of the lads now. Though, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, you, could, you could praise the guy that you picked to the hill just to say he was that good. So. <laughs> the guy, I suppose, yeah. the, the guy I, I like playing with most um, is probably Fabio, I'd say, at Drogheda. I knew you'd pick him, yeah. Um, <laughs> He's a really good, really good player. Yeah. Uh, thing, and it's not. Listen, it's not that Fabio's underrated or anything like that as well, because he's not. But he's probably, he's probably not rated as, as clever a player as he was. He was really right. clever player as well. I think people probably look at his, his, his speed or his, his finishing. But he was a clever footballer as well. You know. So, um, I think I, I'll, 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 I'll give it to Fabio. Keep him happy. That's good. That's grand. Uh, best player he played against. <laughs> Best player I played against. Um, I think the best player I played against actually in the fle- in the flesh when yeah. we were playing anything was Keith Fahey when he was here. Player, yeah. um, I just remember playing up and draw there. I don't think he was back from. I, th- I don't think he was back from England that long. He's playing for Pats. Yeah. And you, it's, there's sometimes you're playing you're you're playing League of Ireland game. You play with guys particularly a good player. He, there's, there's moments in games when you realise he's that like, he shouldn't be here, you know. And he's he one of them. Yeah, and even more so than sort of um, like because Wes would have been playing in the league at the time. Yeah. Kevin Doyle played a small bit as well, probably around that time as well. And they were, listen, they were excellent players, very good players. But I just remember there was there was bits that Keith had in the locker and stuff like that that were just sort of next level, you know, the type of way. So probably I'd say Keith Valley probably. Yeah. Would you actually compare Jack Byrne to him a little bit? I would definitely say so. Yeah, they're probably they're probably yeah. similar enough technically and stuff yeah. like that. You know, excellent strikers of the ball, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, he probably has a bit on Jack physically, maybe, yeah, that type of way. But um, yeah, very very similar players, I suppose. You know, could could see around corners and see things that other people couldn't see. I know some of the balls he used to play through. Like you know, it's alright to see a pass, but to execute that pass, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Like you know, exactly. it just takes the defence out quick. 
fast ball, yeah. but if these are said and done, they, but they make it look easy. <laughs> That's the point, isn't it? Well, listen, I've been try- I, I, I tried to do it for 20 years and I couldn't do it, so yeah, yeah. easy said and done is right. <laughs> Keith Fanny, though, was that t- player that benefited actually by coming back to the League of Ireland, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, and moved on. he was ready to move on when he went over to Birmingham then at the same time, you know, and then obviously the Irish Caps came along, etc., etc. But he benefited yeah. by coming back to the League of Ireland. Actually. I think it's I think it's been coming a, a more well-trodden path, if you know what I, I mean. So. It can yeah. be very difficult to make that initial breakthrough. Mm-hmm. It's very hard. Like, you know, I think especially specifically in the, pre- the Premier <clears> League, <throat> the Premier League is a global league. They're recruiting yeah. players even into their academies and stuff mm-hmm. like that from, you know, all around the world. Mm-hmm. So it's hugely so... Sometimes just taking that step back to go again is the right thing to do. He's a very good example of that, I suppose. And you see, for example, when Birmingham signed him at the time, I can't remember his age, but he was about 23, 24. It could have been more, was he? But anyway, when they signed him at the time, they weren't buying him to put him into an academy. They were buying him to play. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, exactly. they obviously had seen him play and, you know, had faith that he could step up. So yeah. I think it's something that some young players still underestimate a little bit the League of Ireland because I've spoken to some young players who've come back to the League of Ireland and they've actually even said that the standard was higher than they thought it was and you can see yeah. that they're being honest about that as well and I think, as you say it gives them a platform and then they're ready to move over to England when they're in their 20s you know yeah 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 yeah. but um, which manager would you have admired the most or is that another tough one <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that the- <laughs> the, the manager, uh, this will take the manager I played for as well, yeah. I suppose. The manager, I suppose, I played for him and, and probably made the biggest difference to me as a player is probably Paul Doolan, I would say. Um, I might pick him as well. <laughs> um, just uh, yeah. had, a, had a savage intellect for the game, um, Paul, in terms of, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't met another guy who could watch a game of football I, and actually remember a game of football after it had happened, and <laughs> how we did. Um, was just really, really, really good and really good for my game. Actually, just like any of the instructions, they weren't complicated. He never wanted you to do things that you, could, you couldn't do or weren't good at. Um, so really ac- accentuated what you were good at in terms of um, uh, when you were playing. So, um, yeah, I think even in terms of how I think about the game as well, when I think of who influenced you, Paul would be, would be a fairly big influence um, in terms of how you think about it. So I, I, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of players would say that um, about, uh, if they've worked with Paul as well. He is a, he, he, he would uh, influence, uh, he would influence guys when he's worked with them for sure. No, I've heard, had heard great stories about him. Actually, I forgot about Michael O'Neill. No, you didn't play under Michael O'Neill. You, you were, yeah. Yeah. Do you take in terms of your management style? Do you think you've taken bits and pieces from these guys on a subconscious level, or is it a conscious thing that you look at when you're going into management? Um, I, listen, I, there's no doubt so, things go in. If even by osmosis over the years, you know, you're soaking yeah. stuff up, um, yeah. a, and there's 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 bits you take on. There's yeah. bits you're not like, like with the greatest will in the world. I, I, I'm, like for instance, I'm not Paul Doolan, I'm not Michael O'Neill, yeah, exactly. I'm just I'm just Andy Moyler. So um the only way I know how to manage is how I manage. Mm. Uh, be that in football or in work or whatever else like that it is, you you just have, you know, whatever personality there is. Some personalities are have a dint for management or whatever else like that, and some personalities don't. You hope that your own personality does. You have to keep working at it. You have mm. to absolutely have to keep on uh, uh, improving, learning, all of those kind of things as well. Um, and there's bits, there's not, listen, there's bits you will see guys doing over the years about how they dealt with people or how they dealt with situations that you'd say, actually, that worked or that, you know, that didn't work. So yeah. that, learning goes, that learning goes on all the time, I suppose. But I think some guys can fall into the trap or the uh, trap you could potentially fall into is saying, you know, I'll actually just go and try and be like Paul Doolan or I'll go and try and be like Michael O'Neill and stuff like that. And, it's, you know, that's not going to be a thing. You can't do that. It's, you, you, you'll be, see, people will see through it in a very short space of time, you know. Yeah, I'd say what a lot of managers say is things kind of happen on a subconscious level, really, doesn't it? That yeah, yeah, yeah. You might have picked up bits and pieces. You might not even know about it, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and obviously, as you say, then there's your own man and your own self. I'm sure Doolan, Michael O'Neill, etc., took bits and pieces off other people, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's within their, you know, structure, if you like, you know. 
Yes, I don't think. I mean, I I think that's just it. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you've you've got to have as a as a coach or manager, you've got to have a relatively open mind to most things, um, so that you're willing to uh, either you know take uh, lessons <laughs> consciously on board and subconsciously at that stage as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Andy, it's been a pleasure. Enjoy that. Thanks for coming on, and best of luck with UCD. No problem, Keith. Thanks a million. Thank you.